Hi, I'm Mike Duran. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and I'm also the director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East. Um, and I'm joined with my colleague on the other end here, uh, senior fellow Luke Coffey. And it's our great privilege and honor uh, to, to host um, Ambassador Elchin Amrabayov. He is the uh, representative of the president of Azerbaijan for uh, special, uh, special affairs? Same. Special assignments, which sounds, sounds very, very interesting, special assignments. Uh, in, our, in our system, when you have a special assignment, it means you're doing things that are cloak and dagger. I don't know. The, <laughs> the, the, um, We're humble. Uh, we, um, uh, Ambassador, um, uh, Ambassador Amrabayov uh, has a distinguished diplomatic career. He was the uh, ambassador to France, to the Holy See, uh, to the Swiss Federation, and uh, many other assignments. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about uh, the state of U.S.-Azerbaijani relations and uh, also the state of the Azerbaijani-Armenian uh, peace process. And um, with that, why don't you just Give us an, an overview, as you see it, of where the peace process stands at this point. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Luke. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to be here. Uh, indeed, I think when we look at the uh, current state of uh, uh, the peace process between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, we uh, should mention that uh, oh, we have made a substantial progress towards finalizing uh, the peace deal. Uh, we have never been as close uh, 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 you know, to this as uh, never before. So I think uh, there is a historic opportunity right now for both countries to finally uh, close this chapter of animosity and to uh, engage in uh, uh, changing the uh, nature of the region uh, of South Caucasus and to uh, to make it a, a place of uh, good neighborliness and uh, good neighborhood and uh, stability and peace. So uh, of course. As you know, uh, this process has been going on for a long period of time. I mean, uh, we had uh, almost three decades of mediation, but uh, as of uh, uh, last December, you know, we, uh, uh, both countries uh, decided that the best, uh, uh, the most efficient and most promising format to continue the talks and to finalize them would be to do that in the purely bilateral direct format. And ever since, there were some significant achievements, including in terms of building confidence, but also in initiating certain uh, uh, processes like uh, uh, you know, the exchange of diplomatic support, but also uh, uh, including the uh, release of some detainees and uh, the practical uh, uh, commencement of the delimitation process of the border. Uh, so I think that uh, now, if we look at the uh, text of the peace agreement that is on the table, we're very close to uh, finalizing it, and it's Azerbaijan's intention to do its best in order to uh, uh, meet the expectations of the whole international community, but also to, uh, uh, to, to uh, once and for all uh, s resolve this issue, which is at the core of this rivalry and conflict uh, with Armenia, that is the, the claims of Armenian territorial claims to Azerbaijan. So we hope that the, the remaining difficulties uh, will be addressed properly in the uh, short period of time and that we can attain uh, uh, a credible, uh, and durable, and irreversible peace. It, when, you, when you say short period of time, um, could I push you on that? Would you want to speculate? Do you think you could have it done by September, by the COP meeting in, in Baku? Well, to give some timelines uh, is always an ungrateful thing, you know, because, you know, there have been <laughs> so many times in, in the past that, you know, people mentioned concrete deadlines. It will very much depend on the ability and the willingness of uh, the Armenian side to address uh, uh, the only remaining impediment to uh, finalizing a peace deal, and that is to address uh, the constitutionally embedded uh, territorial claims to mm -hmm. Azerbaijan. Uh, because otherwise we do not see any insurmountable difficulty in terms of the text of the peace agreement. Uh, as it was mentioned recently, most of it has been agreed upon. The remaining issues are all doable. But we cannot uh, go ahead and uh, sign the peace deal with uh, turning a blind eye to the, uh, the very existential reason of this conflict, and that is the fact that Armenia uh, you know, had territorial claims to us, and these claims are still valid. 
in accordance with their uh, uh, constitutional legal framework. So the sooner uh, that issue is addressed, uh, the sooner we will get to the final say <coughs> phase. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I want to echo Mike's welcome here for you at Hudson Institute. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Uh, I was in, um, I, I was out west in Las Vegas last week speaking at uh, an event on the NATO summit. And on the sidelines of that event, I was speaking to someone about the South Caucasus, and, and they mentioned Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I said to them, uh, can you believe that they're so close to finally normalizing relations and agreeing to a peace deal? And the, the gentleman didn't know this. He, he was surprised to learn this. And in fact, at first, he didn't believe it until I explained it to him. Um, this, to me, uh, tells me that if, if this seemingly well-informed American who would attend such a conference where I was speaking didn't know about this. Most American policymakers probably don't know. Why should Americans care that Armenia and Azerbaijan are finally on the cusp of securing a, a lasting peace deal? And you know, what can uh, US policymakers be doing more of to help facilitate this and encourage this? Well, actually, uh, one of the questions to this answer is because the United States has always uh, played an important role in promoting stability and, uh, uh, and uh, good neighborly relations in this bigger region, which is the Caspian region, including South Caucasus. Uh, you know, and here I should say that in terms of our bilateral relations with the United States, we have always appreciated the unwavering support that the US gave uh, to Azerbaijan's political independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. We have three decades plus of uh, uh, very, uh, very intensive cooperation in a number of fields. We have a long-standing and very, uh, you know, uh, uh, fruitful cooperation in the energy field, but also we're together in addressing uh, major regional and international security challenges. You know, as you know, uh, Azerbaijani soldiers uh, were fighting shoulder to shoulder with Americans uh, in such hot spots as, as uh, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Iraq, and we were the last ones who left uh, the Kabul airport. So we have shown uh, throughout the decades that uh, we are uh, and could be considered credible partners to the United States. So it is the interest of the US, who which also enjoys good relations with Armenia, that two of these nations uh, in a seemingly remote geographical region of South Caucasus, that they finally overcome their conflict and rivalry, and basically they uh, usher in a new era uh, for prosperity, stability, and development in this region. So that's uh, why one of the reasons why uh, U.S. Uh, cares, and uh, and we commend uh, the the efforts of uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, to facilitate the further progress. I believe that in these turbulent times, you know, uh, it's always gratifying to find at least one spot on the world where there is a, a good opportunity for peace and the uh, positive resolution of. Uh, uh, of an issue uh, that could be found. Yeah. And turning specifically to um, the, the proposed peace agreement with Armenia and the normalization, as I understand it, there are three big issues. One you already addressed, which was the uh, constitutional issue with Armenia's constitution. The other two, as I see them, are um, uh, the status of a transit corridor or Zengazor corridor that could um, allow Azerbaijan proper to link up in some form of transport to Inakshavan, the, uh, the uh, enclave, Azerbaijan's enclave. And then the other issue uh, being the delineation of the, of the full uh, border. And as part of that last point, I know that four villages were recently returned to Azerbaijan. This was seen as a, a big confidence building measure a great act on the side of the Armenians to hand these villages over. I often hear in Washington people talk about these as being enclaves, but they, they weren't enclaves. They were part of you know, the, the contiguous uh, Azerbaijani uh, territory. Um, but I know that there are some enclaves that exist between Armenia and, and Azerbaijan. I think there were three in total one Armenian and two Azerbaijani, or I may have that backwards. But what's the status of these? Are these being discussed as part of the peace deal? Is the Zengazor Corridor being discussed? Um, besides the constitutional issue, how much, uh, how much more you know, progress has to be made? Well, actually, with regard to those villages that you referred to, the four villages in Kazakh region of Azerbaijan, 
uh, well, they are not exclave villages. Yeah. These are the villages which were under illegal occupation by Armenia since early 90s. And basically, the uh, gentleman's agreement on their liberation or evacuation by Armenian forces was reached back in November 2020. It wasn't oh, wow. reflected in the trilateral statement on ceasefire, but it was uh, done in the presence of a third party, which also signed this uh, document. So I think that uh, to portray this as a uh, big concession or as a brave act by Armenia would not be very factually correct, because they uh, delayed the implementation of this commitment right. for three and a half years. Uh, but they did it, and we welcomed that act because we believe that also helped to uh, strengthen the uh, atmosphere around the peace talks. With regard to the remaining second group of villages, uh, there are four more villages. Three of them are, uh, all of four of them are exclave villages. Uh, three of them are Azerbaijani, and one is Armenian uh, right. in our territory. But uh, uh, the mutual understanding from both parties is that this issue uh, would be better off if it's treated uh, within the framework of the delimitation process. Right. Okay. So since the progr progress already has been made in delimitating and even demarcating the first segment of that future border between the two countries, I think uh, at some point in time, both delegations will decide that it's time to tackle this one. But I think that uh, it, is, it should not be portrayed as a big obstacle or difficulty because you know there is a common understanding that uh, this is part of the broader process. If I may just say a word about uh, the uh, uh, what I refer to as uh, uh, this transit or Zangizur corridor, for us, I think that uh, if we speak about a long-term sustainable and irreversible peace, uh, uh, the opening of this transportation link, namely the railroad, which existed, by the way, in the Soviet Union yeah. time. It's a 26 miles long uh, railroad. The, its reopening uh, is one of those uh, immediate deliverables of peace, uh, which could be to the benefit not only of Azerbaijan, but more even so uh, to the benefit of Armenia. Because basically, as you know, because of the occupation of Azerbaijani lands for almost three decades, Armenia was completely isolated in the region. It was deprived of any participation, any economic projects in South Caucasus. Uh, and uh, actually, this can change the situation. It could be a game changer yeah. for the whole region. They can also put their name back on the geoeconomic and geopolitical map. Uh, this also uh, will allow us to put an end to an isolated situation in which uh, 500,000 Azerbaijanis living in Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic uh, might be relinked with the main part of Azerbaijan. So I think that uh, it's a win-win project. Uh, on top of that, uh, we hear a lot uh, Armenian government speaking about this famous project of crossroads of peace. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the only way to implement that would be uh, to allow Armenia to have two out of its four borders which are closed to open. And that is uh, only if uh, they uh, basically come up with a viable solution uh, uh, that would envisage the security of passage of Azerbaijani citizens through that portion of Armenian territory. So we very much look forward that this will happen. Uh, and I think that, uh, among other things, this uh, reopening of that route may serve as a confidence-building measure between yeah. the two countries, because it will, to a certain extent, uh, you know, increase the interdependence of them. And, you know, one of the best guarantees for peace to stay is when both parties have something to lose if they renege on their commitments. So, and a word more on this first issue, which is the constitutional uh, conundrum, I think that uh, uh, we have always to understand that this is the raison d'etre, as they say, uh, the, the real reason of uh, uh, this uh, decades-long uh, rivalry and confrontation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So f without addressing this existential yeah. problem to Azerbaijani security, it would be naive to think that this peace could be uh, credible, or it could be endurable, or it could be irreversible. Unfortunately, we still are not reassured uh, about the uh, sincerity uh, of uh, Armenian authorities when they say that they have abandoned their territorial claims to Azerbaijan because there is a clear discrepancy between their rhetoric, official public rhetoric, between their commitment to sign the peace agreement, the letter and spirit of which uh, basically excludes the possibility of territorial claims, and the existing uh, situation uh, with a, a constitutional legal yeah. framework. So this contradiction 
uh, needs to be uh, resolved uh, so that uh, that could open the road, the path towards eventual peace. Mike, if I may, a quick follow up on this. It's a very interesting point in the beginning about these four villages being part of a gentleman's agreement and it didn't make it into that final uh, cease, tri, uh, three party ceasefire agreement in November of 2020. Why was that? Um, why, why wasn't this uh, more explicit or, or more public facing? Well, actually, I, I wasn't obviously there, but what I've heard was the fact that uh, you know uh, the third party thought that you know the third uh, party being Russia, Russia, yeah. it may it may <laughs> basically make uh, it even more difficult for Pashinyan uh, to have this clause also reflected in this trilateral statement, because he already uh, was committing to withdraw his troops uh, from Lachin, from Kelbajar, yeah. and from Agdam regions. So basically, it was a kind of uh, a request. Uh, to uh, allow him to deal with this issue without necessarily putting it into public. Right. But unfortunately, it took uh, him uh, three and a half years yeah. almost uh, to, uh, to live up to this yeah. Uh, promise. Yeah, I see. That clarifies a lot of that. Thank you. Following up on that, uh, my, my view of um, the Armenian dilemma, um, and I'm, I'm presenting this because I'd love to, to see if it, if it it comports with your understanding of the the problem is that th there are within Armenia or within the Armenian world maybe if it's better more accurate to say there are two rival conceptions of Armenia that are battling it out one is the one conception focuses on the the actual country of three million people that exists next to you and the other one is an, an idea of a greater Armenia that, uh, that um, excites the imagination of uh, lots of Armenians, in particular the Karabakh Armenians and the diaspora. The diaspora in Glendale, in, 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 uh, in Marseille, and, and, in, and in Moscow. And they are committed to this, to this dream of Armenia that doesn't actually exist. And, uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan represents actual Armenia that, that exists. But in terms of making policy, he has to contend with, with both. And he has to, he, has to he, he, uh, he can't simply make policy on the basis of the actual Armenia. He has to, uh, he has to pay lip service to and deference to the, the um, greater Armenian I, uh, idea um, because the diaspora has influenced Ar Armenian politics. The Karabakh Armenians inside Armenia have uh, influence. And outside powers are also interested in promoting the greater Armenian idea because it, it serves their interests. And so when you insist on the constitutional change, that that's really forces Armenia to make to, uh, 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 once and for all a decision to make its policy based on the country that actually exists and to abandon these, 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 these wider aspirations. So my, my first question is, is that, how, is that how you understand the dilemma? Well, actually, uh, yes, I, I would refer uh, your first question to uh, the statement which was made by Prime Minister Pashinyan some time ago, where he invited uh, his uh, population uh, to abandon the idea of some of, uh, you know, Armenia, which is based on phantasm, and to deal with the real Armenia and to make sure that this real Armenia survives, uh, you know, and remains uh, uh, as a state. Uh, so I think that he also realizes that uh, this is a, a, a challenge that he has to face. Uh, now, with regard to uh, uh, how difficult it is for him to uh, come up with uh, uh, constitutional amendments, uh, I think that. Uh, we should also uh, not forget that the most difficult part was already done by him when he openly uh, acknowledged that uh, he has no territorial claims to Azerbaijan. He even cited the number of square meters and kilometers of territory which he considers to be the territory of our country. He also, uh, uh, through his foreign minister, agreed on uh, the uh, five fundamental basic principles that were put into uh, as a basis of the draft peace agreement, one of which is uh, uh, mutual respect for each other's you know, uh, territory, integrity, sovereignty, 
and abandoning uh, now and in the future of any territorial claims. Mm. So the most difficult part in order to, uh, you know, to pass over the message has been done by him. Now what is uh, expected uh, from him is uh, to uh, bring into conformity his uh, rhetoric and his political statement, which I acknowledge is a way forward, with the real situation on the ground. Because uh, if he just will say that it's going to be difficult for me to address this issue only because I may have uh, certain difficulties back home, uh, I mean, for us, uh, it is a poor consolation. So basically, we expect him to deliver on uh, the official position that he, as the prime minister, has already declared. That is. Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan's internationally recognized territory, and Armenia has no claims on that, and that they are ready on the basis of this premise uh, to normalize relations with their neighbor and even neighbors, because, of course, normalization between Armenia and Turkey also is very much uh, linked to the progress between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So I don't think that this is something which uh, 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 may be portrayed as an existential challenge for him. Uh, what is needed is just a, an amendment which would basically address uh, the, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the real uh, reason of this rivalry. Uh, because, I mean, imagine if we go ahead and we sign it, and then, I mean, uh, after a certain period of time, a new government of Armenia uh, comes to power, and then they will say that, well, you know, the one which was signed by the previous prime minister uh, it's it, not legitimate. It, is, it, it is not legitimate mm -hmm. because it contradicts the letter and spirit of our constitution. Right, right. And according to Armenian constitution, the constitution has a legal, supreme legal force. So obviously, any constitutional court, if it has to pronounce itself on, uh, on the nature of this peace agreement, it should say that it is in contradiction. So therefore, it could not be ratified. So that means that we will leave a door open uh, for the future uh, return for this, you know, revanchist, you know, uh, rhetoric. And as we see, it's getting more and more hold in Armenia today. So that's why I think uh, it is a, an issue uh, which could not be ignored by anyone who really wishes uh, peace to take place. Let, let, me, let me ask you a little bit about outside powers. And it, I want to ask in particular about one. Uh, and I know it, which one. Yeah. No, you, you probably don't. Okay, so... France. Is it, ah, okay. Because <laughs> I went. I, I, I went a different country. I, 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 as well, I so. have. I want to get to the others as we go. I know. Okay. You, 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 thought I was going to bring up Iran. Yeah. But I will. I will after after Luke perhaps. But but there's no one better. There's no one better to explain French Azerbaijani relations to us than yourself, and um, uh, the the developments there lately have been amazing. Uh, the the, the Azerbaijani fr French conflict in New Caledonia, for example, is a <laughs> really, uh, I think, a surprise to surprise to everyone. Can you, uh, to the extent as possible for you, can you just give us a sense of what role France is playing in this question of the particular of the of the constitutional amendment and and the the, the greater Armenia versus the actual Armenia. Um, what, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? And, and uh, do, you, do you see them as playing a, um, a, a spoiler role? Well, you mentioned Caledonia. I think that uh, it would be correct uh, to refer uh, to the point of departure of this deterioration, not that one, but you know, the, uh, 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 the stance which was adopted by uh, France you know, uh, since the beginning of the Second Karabakh War. And we have seen that if during previous decades they tried to keep uh, a kind of a semblance of uh, you know, uh, even-handed approach, I mean, this time around they decided to completely uh, invest themselves uh, in supporting one of the two belligerent uh, countries. So I think that uh, that should be referred as the you know, starting point of uh, what we are observing today. Uh, with regard to what they think about uh, this constitutional amendment, it's a bit difficult uh, for me to say something, because my guess may be as good as yours. Uh -huh. Because as a matter of fact, uh, formally, France is no way is uh, involved, at least you know, visibly, uh, in, the, uh, in the peace process today. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, not only because of what's happening in bilateral relations between Armenia, Azerbaijan and France, but also because it was the uh, deliberate uh, 
uh, decision of, of both countries uh, to uh, uh, continue and to finalize the peace uh, process uh, within the direct bilateral format. So, uh, of course, as a country which uh, is very close to Armenia, they may have certain uh, ideas about this and how they would like this to be settled, but uh, it's very hard for me to comment on that. Well, let me maybe be a little, pardon me, Luke, one more, just a little more pointed about it. What is it that you're specifically that you're seeing from France that is, has, uh, has pushed the tensions between, or has increased the tensions well, actually, so dramatically between, between well, two it's, it's not difficult. You just have to look at the long list of those steps which were considered quite hostile by Azerbaijan ever since the conflict started. You know, this, uh, the positions which were expressed publicly, uh, both at the level of executive power, but also the uh, two chambers of their parliament, and uh, not to speak about municipalities and other kind of uh, uh, segments of their uh, uh, public. So this uh, position uh, is not warranted because, I mean, it's not based on the, uh, on the uh, respect of international law because, you know, what Azerbaijan did during 44 days uh, back in 2020 was to restore justice. Uh, and he, Azerbaijan uh, basically, uh, through this 44-day successful military operation, which was as a reaction to the Armenian provocation, they, uh, it restored uh, its territorial integrity. So basically what the whole international community failed to do, including through the Institute of uh, Mediation of OSC Minsk Group for 28 years, Azerbaijan did it itself. So uh, to hold this biased position against uh, not only Azerbaijan, but also against international law is not something which, as, as I say, is, is, is understandable and warranted. So I think that... Uh, that is the core reason of this deterioration because, I mean, in previous times, I mean, I remember uh, on my watch as a, as a best in France, you know, we had a very uh, advanced uh, level of these relations. You know, we were engaged in regular and very intensive political dialogue. Uh, economic uh, relations were there on their rise. Uh, we had lots of uh, French companies present in Azerbaijan, but also cultural, humanitarian, uh, and other uh, fields also were very much uh, up to the uh, quality of political dialogue. So I think that uh, I hope that uh, you know this position, uh, which is hostile towards Azerbaijan, will be uh, ended, and that uh, you know our France, like the rest of the international community, will mm -hmm. basically accept uh, the new realities uh, in the region. Uh, it will also uh, finally accept the new status quo because the idea of Azerbaijan is to have an inclusive uh, model of South Caucasus, which is based on, on good neighborly relations, on uh, sustainable and irreversible peace and stability. So I think that if someone wants to help in these circumstances Armenia, it has to, first of all, encourage Armenia to stay on the course towards peaceful resolution and not to uh, lose its motivation to participate uh, in peace talks uh, and in contacts, like it was the case uh, very recently during the EPC summit uh, in Blenheim in UK, when uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan uh, basically rejected uh, the proposal by our British hosts uh, to participate in a trilateral meeting uh, with participation of uh, new British Prime Minister Pistama. So I think without talking to each other, without uh, accepting all the proposals to continue this dialogue, it's difficult to expect that uh, the remainder uh, of this road towards peace could be uh, achieved. You mentioned um, Turkey and Armenia also in talks to normalize and reopen the border. Um, it was in, I think it was 1993 when Turkey closed that border with Armenia over um, Armenia's actions in the first Karabakh war. And uh, now we are seeing even today, I believe today, uh, a Turkish and Armenian officials meeting at that border to discuss this uh, reopening. Do you think that Armenian Azerbaijani normalization and Turkey Armenia normalization have to run in, in parallel uh, alongside one another for the region to fully receive the benefits of you know foreign investment, economic development, more transit routes, or do you think? you know, one could succeed with the other remaining frozen or unsettled? 
Well, as it was mentioned many times by uh, official uh, Baku, uh, I think that our approach uh, towards resolving uh, uh, of all remaining difficulties and problems and challenges in the region is a rather holistic one. So I think that uh, our Turkish uh, friends, they also realize that uh, you know, uh, improvement of uh, relations between uh, Armenia and Turkey is very much linked to the progress which could be achieved between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, because, I mean, uh, the very reason why, as you mentioned yourself, of, uh, you know, uh, the fact that the, uh, the, the borders were closed back in 93 was the fact of uh, the Armenia's aggression and occupation. So technically speaking, unless we sign a peace agreement and uh, unless we are finalizing this peace deal and we eliminate all the possible challenges to sustainability of this peace, it would be premature for me to speak about the expediency of putting a cart in front of the horse, yes. as they say. And I think that we are on the same page with our Turkish uh, friends because they also realize that you know, this issue of territorial claims in this region of South Caucasus needs to be treated uh, uh, immediately. And uh, any steps which might complicate uh, already very fragile atmosphere around the peace process should be avoided. I'm uh, always amazed uh, at the uh, uh, openness and frankness of uh, President Aliyev, um, and uh, he recently in a, in Baku in a meeting with uh, uh, with the press and think tank uh, um, representatives had some very uh, pointed uh, criticisms of U.S. policy. Um, um, I was I was a bit surprised by it, and I wonder if you could give us a sense of. Um, what, what's happened to, uh, to, to generate that frustration? And uh, do you think your trip here now um, is, is going to bring about a different result? Well, I think Mr. President was quite eloquent about the uh, dynamics and the, uh, uh, you know, the origins of this uh, uh, position that he expressed. But at the same time, we also realized that uh, both uh, countries, US and Azerbaijan, have recently reiterated their uh, commitment, full commitment to uh, develop further and to deepen this very important relationship. Uh, both uh, parties, they see uh, enormous potential which is not tapped in order to elevate the quality of these relations to a completely new level. At the same time, uh, as they say among friends, uh, we're always friends. Yeah? So, I mean, he also wanted to say that uh, if indeed uh, this relationship is important to the United States, uh, we uh, also expect that uh, this relationship should be given its credit where the credit is due and it should not be confounded you know, with some other external factors. In other words, I mean, uh, it should not be uh, you know, uh, carried out uh, through the prism of uh, you know, uh, relationship with uh, Armenia. Uh, we all understand the, uh, uh, the political uh, sensitivities, especially at this particular moment, uh, pre-election uh, election period in the United States, but I think that uh, uh, our uh, expectation is that the United States will uh, uh, duly assess uh, the potential and the uh, possible uh, positive implications of uh, upgrading and deepening relations with Azerbaijan at this particular period in time, where, as I said, in the South Caucasus, we are witnessing uh, you know, a new uh, geopolitical reality. Uh, we see a new status quo, and we all understand, I think many, one, uh, many would agree that Azerbaijan uh, is uh, uh, doomed to play a, a key and uh, I would say a linchpin role, uh, you know, in this region. So I think that uh, if uh, uh, if we want to see this uh, uh, region to be in peace and stability and prosperity, of course the uh, interests, uh, the vital national interests of Azerbaijan need to be respected. And uh, I think that. Uh, if we look at the go back to the peace process, I mean, uh, I already said that it's a purely bilateral uh, thing and the format which was uh, chosen by two countries. In, if someone wants to really promote peace, uh, our expectation is that uh, uh, these parties would refrain from any actions which may be construed as uh, you know, uh, uh, creating unfavorable environment around the peace talks. Uh, and I think that uh, in this regard, uh, we uh, uh, expect that uh, Armenia, um, you know, will not be uh, demotivated uh, 
from uh, staying uh, engaged in the peace process by uh, some new uh, uh, you know, uh, events or developments uh, which we are observing in this region. Of course, uh, uh, I think that uh, it's true that uh, we are witnessing today uh, efforts to uh, you know, help Armenia build up its military potential. Uh, uh, be it uh, through bilateral channels or uh, through, uh, for example, the European Union's uh, um, uh, EPF, uh, European Peace Fund Initiative, uh, pumping Armenia with military uh, assistance, including lethal weapons, at the uh, stage when peace process is, uh, uh, is living through a very historic and crucial moment, mm -hmm. I think is not very responsible towards peace. And I think that uh, instead of uh, trying to uh, uh, strengthen the resilience of Armenia by helping it uh, kind of militarily or expanding its military potential, I think uh, those uh, 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 who are in favor of peace or the real friends of peace, they would be better off if they would just uh, stop doing that, but encourage, in, uh, on the contrary, Armenia to, uh, to do whatever it needs to do so that this historic opportunity for peace is not, uh, peace is not missed. So c if I could just repeat back to you what I heard, and you can tell me if I got it right, because I, I heard two major messages there. One is support the peace process by refraining from building up the forces in Armenia that are against uh, the, the peace deal. And, uh, and, and number two, and this is where I'm a, a little bit more of a question, I heard you say to the United States that you would like the U.S.-Azerbaijani relationship to have a status all its own and that, uh, and that relations with Azerbaijan will not always be held hostage to, the, to, to U.S.-Armenian relations, that there'll, be a, uh, that there'll be a kind of separate bilateral, bilateral track with its own agenda and its, uh, and its own set of concerns. Yes, if I may reinterpret what you interpreted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, uh, first I meant that it would be uh, advisable, and what we can expect is that uh, at this uh, very important uh, moment in the peace process, uh, you know, anyone who really wants to help these two nations to finally close this chapter of animosity, we expect them to be uh, even-handed and balanced in their approach. So that's why we should not send, uh, send any wrong messages to Armenia that they can uh, engage in some delaying tactics or, you know, uh, imitation of participation in the peace process, but using this pause in order to... Uh, uh, restore their military uh, potential and then to go back to uh, uh, anew to, uh, to square one. Uh, and secondly, I think that, uh, yes, uh, uh, we believe that uh, potential of U.S.-Azerbaijani relations is big. Uh, besides traditional fields where we have so successfully uh, collaborated, be it uh, energy, energy security, uh, be it uh, international and regional security matters, including uh, fight against terror. Uh, there are many others, uh, digital, digital transformation, you know, this uh, green energy transformation. I mean, we very much uh, value uh, excellent cooperation which exists between uh, Azerbaijani COP29 presidency and the United States uh, delegation. We expect uh, full-fledged participation of the United States in November when we will be hosting this uh, global event. I think that uh, there are other fields like humanitarian, cultural, agriculture, uh, you know, economic and trade issues on which we can look anew. So the time has come uh, when the approach of, uh, to this relationship will be rather merit-based. It would be even-handed. And uh, when Azerbaijan could be uh, offered a, a level playing field, when, uh, uh, and by this, uh, this could uh, help us uh, all untap the uh, unused potential. So for that, we need to deal with certain uh, irritants and some of the uh, uh, difficulties in our relations. Of course, uh, you know very well about this uh, Section 907 of the Freedom Support Act, which was adopted back in uh, 92 when Azerbaijani territories were one after another getting under Armenian military control. So we still believe it's, uh, uh, it's not a helpful and uh, discriminate decision, which basically was waived for long periods of time. And we hope that uh, uh, the understanding uh, will uh, be restored in the uh, United States, that this is unnecessary complication, which uh, 
should not be allowed to uh, shadow uh, the excellent prospects that we may have uh, in our bilateral relationship. And uh, it also should be mentioned that uh, the recent uh, exchange of uh, letters between our presidents, uh, but also recent uh, visits at different high level visits between uh, Baku and Washington, uh, they all abode well uh, for the future uh, kind of development of this relationship because I think uh, we are hearing uh, clearly from the United States the uh, willingness to uh, re-engage and to uh, elevate uh, uh, relations with Azerbaijan to a qualitatively new level. I think we all agree 907 needs to be scrapped and it's uh, it, it, it was always politically motivated and driven and it doesn't help advance U.S. national interests in the South Caucasus or the region. You know, with everything going on in the world today, all the geopolitical challenges, one thing that the world could use is stabilization and normalization in the South Caucasus. So Mike and I uh, wish um, you and your delegation and your Armenian counterparts good luck as uh, everyone continues to find a lasting peace in this region. I want to thank our uh, viewers today for tuning in uh, for this important discussion about the situation in the South Caucasus. And I invite you to check out Hudson.org if you want to learn more about some of the work Mike and I and our colleagues are doing on this region. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day.